Okay, so good morning everyone. Today we will continue with our signs of the brain. This is the first part, the, sorry, the third part today. Uh, just someone keep uh, the time, meaning, okay? So, what do we have here? This is a sagittal MRI of the brain, magnified view of the corpus callosum, showing what? What's the name of the sign of the appearance? Sorry? No, this is not dose and finger. Dose and fingers is, we'll see it later. Hello. The, it's oval shaped, elongated, like a finger. These are dots, okay? No, no, the corpus callosum is not thin, but, but this, the uh, hyper intense, sorry, just let me, the hyper intense signal, these are what's called stack of coins, they call it, or sometimes called callosa subtel, subcallosal striations, sometimes they call it venous necklace. All of these are the names for the same sign, venous necklace. Uh, stack of coins, callosal septal striations, uh, subcallosal striations, it's all the same. It's just uh, another, it indicates multiple sclerosis, it's just the same. But the appearance, this is not dosing fingers, these are called stack of coins or venous necklace. Okay, or callosal septal striation. This is what we mean by ven uh, venous necklace. You see this uh, beads, uh, they wear it. Okay, uh, so. As we said, there are multiple linear hyper intensities at the callosal septal interface, and it is usually a diagnostic of multiple sclerosis. We know the multiple sclerosis is a chronic demyelinating disorder, which is diagnosed ac according to special criteria. It has spatial uh, and temporal uh, heterogeneity scattered in space and time, as we said. Uh, on thin section sagittal flare MR imaging, the hyper intense foci can be seen along the under surface of the corpus callosum. Okay, at uh, its junction with the septum pellucidum, that's why I call scalosa septal uh, abnormalities. They are uh, oriented perpendicular instead of parallel to the epidemic, created what's called stack of coins or venous necklace appearance. It's highly sensitive and specific for detection of early MS. Okay, this uh, appearance. Good. Now, what do we have here? There is some, this is a T2 axial image, and this is a diffusion weighted image showing some hyper intense lesion within the third ventricle, I think, third pineal region more, and it is diffusion restricted, okay? It looks cystic. However, diffusion restricted. So what does this indicate? Epidermoid. Most likely it will be an epidermoid because it's cystic, looks like arachnoid cyst here, but on the diffusion restriction, it's diff restricted. And this corresponds to epidermoid. Well, what's the sign that we see here? This is a mass showing what we called cauliflower or lobulated outline or scalloped outline. This is the cauliflower. I don't like it. I don't love it. Okay? Uh, <laughs> this is the only thing that I don't like. Okay? So, cauliflower or lobulated or scalloped appearance. Uh, of course, since it's cystic, it's either arachnoid cyst or epidermoid cyst. Since it's diffusion restricted, it's epidermoid cyst. Uh, the epidermoid cysts are rare congenital inclusion cysts typically occur in extra-axial locations, such as pineal region, cerebellopontine angles lesion. Uh, yeah, the cerebellopontine angle is very common. They demonstrate lobulated or cauliflower margin uh, with insulation into adjacent structures and neurovascular uh, encasement. They just grow over time and infiltrate and encase everything. That's what makes it difficult to be resected neurosurgically. It's difficult because it grows slowly. It's congenital, present at birth, but increasing size over time, years and years and years, and they just infiltrate. When it becomes symptomatic, it becomes so difficult to excise. Okay? Uh, the internal contents are mildly T2 hyperintense to CSF. 
with persistent signal on the flare. So they don't suppress with the flare. They are more hyperintense than CSF. I think there is CSF on. Okay. Uh, the lack of flare suppression and the presence of reduced diffusion enable the distinction of epidermoid from arachnoid cyst. Occasionally, internal protein, lipids, and or hemorrhage may produce T1 hyperintense signal, so-called white epidermoid. You can see it on T1 hyperintense, some variety of it. Can be hemorrhage, can be protein, can be lipid content. These are called white epidermoids. Okay, still it's the same epidermoid, but can appear. So, epidermoid can appear hyperintense on T1. Yes, it can. Yeah, uh, as we said, it insinuate, it infiltrate, it extend through any possible space. It grows in size over time, can go through the foramen magnum, into the cerebellopontine angles. Wherever it can go, it will go. Okay. Now, I think this one is a little bit difficult. To no, no. It's not mesial temporal sclerosis. The the first of all, what is the abnormality? The appearance is almost the same, but what do you see here? What else? Look. First of all, you can see there is a diffuse brain atrophy. Okay? Dilated ventricle, but not hydrocephalus. It's ex vacuo dilatation due to do, uh, the widened gyri, widened sulci, sorry. Okay? And this is an old man. This is like maybe more than 60 years old. I just, uh, there are pointers at the site of the abnormality. There is atrophy of the hippocampi bilaterally, okay? You can see this, this fissure here is widened. The temporal horn of the lateral ventricle okay. is prominent, although there is no hydrocephalus, as we said, okay? So that's what we call choroidal or hippocampal fissure dilatation. Sometimes people call it, the, the whole brain give it the appearance of cracked walnut. Cracked walnut, walnut what? Okay, cracked. The brain is just like opened. Okay, and it's very diagnosed, very, very in favor of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, yeah, there is temporal lobe atrophy in general, hippocampal in particular, leading to widening of the fissure. The fissure here will be widened without signs of hydrocephalus. Okay, so. Uh, as we said, there is diffuse cerebral volume loss with enlargements of the sulci. It's suggestive of uh, Alzheimer's disease, and it's the, mo uh, the Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. As what's wrong? Uh, of dementia, as we said, uh, it, there is cerebral atrophy, particularly the temporal and parietal lobes. Okay, uh, a reliable early imaging marker of Alzheimer's disease is bilateral hippocampal atrophy with resulting dilatation of the perihippocampal fissures. So it's a reliable sign. When you see it in an elderly or older age group, it's very sensitive. In advanced cases, there is more, more widespread atrophy with symmetrical enlargement of the cell psi. Uh, this finding is best appreciated along the high cerebral convexities, creating what's called cracked walnut appearance. This dilated cell side, just like the walnut the jaws. Mm. Mm. It's the T2 of the CSF that gives this appearance. It's not flare, it's T2. Okay? You need to see it on a flare image to, to say there's a mesial temporal sclerosis. Okay? On the T2, standard T2, it's not the diagnostic uh, sequence, let's say. Okay. First of all, MT MTS is in much younger age group. Much, much younger. Okay, any yani pediatric to early adulthood. First. Second, there is no diffuse brain atrophy with MTS. It's just atrophy of the hippocampus. Third, most of the times, MTS is usually unilateral. Can be bilateral, but it's very rare. Yes. 
usually unilateral. Fourth, the presentation is with convulsions. So there are a lot of things that will help you differentiate. Uh, so correlation with the clinical symptoms is crucial for the diagnosis because the findings can be difficult to distinguish from age-related volume loss and other dementing disorders. Okay? Now, what's this? What kind of a nuclear study? What do you call this? No, no. What's the imaging modality? PET CT? No, it's not PET CT. On PET, the brain is highly metabolically hyperactive. It will be all brighter, like a light, the whole brain. So, what is the imaging modality? See, the basic question, no one has any idea. Just what, should, what, what's this imaging? I'm not asking for any sign or anything. This is SPECT, single emission, uh, phot emission photon spectrum, uh, single photon emission CT scan, SPECT, okay? Using iodine 123, 123, okay? Showing what we call circle or oval sign or sometimes they call it period sign period 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 fetra okay what does that mean first of all the basal ganglia are highly Metabolic. metabolically active so if you look carefully there is lack of activation of the codate it's the lentiform that's active the codet, the head of codet is not active. Okay? So, can you get something from that? What causes the head of the codet to be inactive? It's atrophic. Okay? No, here in, in here it's Parkinsonian syndrome. So, there is uh, one uh, iodine, iodine 123 SPECT CT showing absence of tracer uptake in the putamina and decreased uptake in the codate nuclei and it's usually diagnostic of Parkinsonian syndromes. This just looks like by this, this one? Yeah. First, uh, let's discuss the findings here. When there is a diagnostic uncertainty between Parkinsonian and other disorders, baseline SPECT can be performed with dopamine transporter ligand Iodine one two three commercially known the commercial name Malta is Da T scan, D A T scan or Dat scan. An abnormal appearance is absence of putaminal uptake with normal decreased with normal or decreased codate uptake. So there is putamina uptake is lost and codate uptake is lost or decreased. Okay. Yeah which may be unilateral or bilateral, what's called period sign. This indicates nigrostriatal neurodegenerative condition, which can be one of the following. Either Parkinson's disease, atypical Parkinsonism, Lewy body dementia, for which dopaminergic therapy may be beneficial. Normally, there is bilateral symmetrical uptake in the caudate and the putamina, what's called coma sign. It will be like a coma, the shape. Okay? Caudate and putamina, the whole thing. Uh... This indicates a non nigrostriatal etiology like Alzheimer, dementia, essential tremor, vascular drug related. If you see the comma sign, then there is non nigrostriatal pathology like Alzheimer's disease. It's not related to the nigrostriatal pathology. How might you see both of them? Patient has symptoms. They want to know which kind of disease he ha is having. Yeah. So they send him for SPECT. If the normal appearance happens, which is the, the comma sign, then there is a non nigrostriatal pathology, like Alzheimer's disease. If the period sign is seen, then it can be some sort of nigrostriatal pathology, like Parkinsonian syndromes. Okay? So, the non nigrostriatal, like the Alzheimer, will not respond to dopaminergic therapy. So, it's really affecting the management of the patient. Okay? Okay. Next one. Prominent, but I don't think 
we will know it. Let's try. Sorry? Adam? What's the sign first? No, it's not Adam. Not acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis. There, is, there are multifocal bilateral lesions. This is a flare and this is a T2 axial brain images showing alternating hypo, hyper, hypo, hyper. So, uh, target is one. These are alternating, multiple. Do you have any idea what's the sign? It's what called concentric bands, rings, or concentric rings, sometimes called lamellated, sometimes called onion skin appearance. Does anyone know what that onion skin appearance indicates? <laughs> In the bone, it's very hostile reaction, <laughs> but no. Yeah, some sort of demolition. Which condition? Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's within the abnormality, but what's the name of the disease? No, no, It's called, it's an aggressive form of MS called Balo. Balo concentric sclerosis, okay? You can see multiple rounded areas of white matter hyperintensity with a concentric layered appearance, hypo, hyper, hypo, hyper, hypo, hyper. For the first instance, when you see it, you say, oh, this is metastasis. Yeah, metastasis. It looks like a metastasis, right? But if you look carefully, this onion ring appearance with the clinical history, of course, it will help you to go into other forms. Of course, if you keep it in mind, baloconcentric sclerosis, it's rare, aggressive variant of multiple sclerosis. There is uh, concentric layers of demyelination, which is the onion skin appearance. There will be alternating hyper and hypo intense bands corresponding to the demyelination and myelinated white matter. Demyelinated, myelinated, demyelinated, myelinated, and so on. Although the tamifactive appearance has been confused with neoplasia, but the, but the lamellated imaging pattern is pathognomonic for the demyelination. Okay? So we should be careful when you see this appearance not to jump for metastasis. There are other possibilities. Okay? Nice. The, as we said, it is an aggressive form of demyelination, not the usual MS. Uh, it's uh, usual MS, you, you, during the active phase, you will see some minimal surrounding edema, minimal. You can see some diffusion restriction, black youth stage, okay? Even some post-contrast enhancement, but not like this. This is a very aggressive, aggressive form, okay? Lucky we are that it's rare. It will enhance. The areas of demyelination, the active demyelination, will show enhancement. Yeah. I agree. I totally agree. Difficult to be differentiated from neoplasms. Now, the next one is easy. I think you'll know the diagnosis by just like that. What's this? Dermal Douglas disease. What's the appearance? What's the sign? Tigroid. Exactly. Stripped, striated, laminated, cordary. Cordary is the cordary. Oh, cordary. You can see this here, striated appearance. What's the little bit dog loss? First of all, this is the cordary appearance, the same, it looks like almost similar to here. There will be uh, expanded cerebellar folia alternating hyper and hypo intense bands, hyper, hypo, and the left cerebral, cerebellar hemisphere and the vermis, okay? So, what's the other name of Lermit dog loss disease? The, the scientific name, let's say. Okay, it's a type of denit, exactly. It is dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytoma. Okay, it's maybe more difficult than Leroy Douglas, dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytoma, but uh, yeah, this is the more pathological term for it. It's a rare hamartomatous lesion, it's hamartoma. Uh, characterized by hypertrophy of the stratum granulosum. This is a result of characteristic disorganization and enlargement 
of the cerebellar folia which appear as T2 hyper intense to iso intense and T1 hypo to iso intense what's, what's called the cordary sign uh, it is associated with codin disease codin disease what is it what are the findings of codin disease colonic polyps which kind of polyps hamartomas, hamartomas. multiple hamartomas exactly Patients with codon syndrome exhibit hamartomas of the skin, mucous membranes, and increase the risk of benign malignant tumors of various organ systems, including breast, thyroid, GI, genital urinary, and gynecologic. Okay? Now, what's going on here? Remember, two things the radiologists miss. The very small and the very large. No. No. Some sort of encephalitis. What is the features that made you say that? No. There is throughout the cerebral cortex. There is what. All the cerebral cortex is hyper is hyper intense on a T2 and diffusion restricted. The cortex, okay. I told you there are two things the radiologists miss: the very small and the very large. Okay, everything is abnormal. This whole cortex is abnormal. This is what we call it cortical ribbon. It looks like this, like a ribbon. Okay. Due to some sort of ischemic injury, like in hypoxic ischemic injury, Crutzfeld Jacobs disease, meningoencephalitis, metabolic disorders, post ictal state can show you this appearance. The yeah, whole core. Uh, Hip is usually unilateral and usually in the limbic system, temporal and then goes to the colossal and pericolosal areas. Uh, more in, more asymmetrical rather than yeah, symmetrical asymmetric. so it will not be th in this appearance okay first of all you should know that the cortical gray matter is eight times more metabolically active than the white matter yes. okay so it's highly susceptible to injury from many causes the cortical signal hyper intensity on t2 weighted and diffusion weighted sequences the cortical ribbon can be seen with various etiologies like we said, vascular, toxic, metabolic, post-ectal, inflammatory, infectious, neoplastic. The vascular causes include the arterial infarcts, the venous thrombosis, some metabolic conditions like hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, drug exposure, hypoglycemia, mitochondrial disorders. Infectious etiologies include period disease, Christopher Jacob disease, uh, viral uh, tuberculosis, fungal encephalitis, neoplastic involvement of the cortex is suggestive of primary glial tumors. Should you should keep in mind that other MR sequences can, should be reviewed uh, to identify contrast enhancement, hemorrhage, mass, clinical history should be uh, known. Additional abnormalities of the basal ganglia, thalamic, corpus callosum, white matter, cerebellum, brainstem should help to narrow the differential diagnosis so what we are seeing here is not diagnostic of anything it's just a sign with the other sequences with the patient's history with the lab test with the age with the presentation the whole thing can help you to go to different to certain diagnosis it's just a sign one of the things that can uh, help you narrow the differential diagnosis okay so what do we have here Okay, subdural fluid, whether it's hygroma, hematoma, whatever, was the sign. And what's the difference between here and here? These are two different patients. This and this. What's the difference between the findings? Racing car sign. This is what's called cortical vein sign. Okay, what do we mean by that? In the first patient, uh, there is bilateral subdural hygromas showing inward displacement of the cortical vein away from the dura. While in the second one, there is cerebral volume loss showing a large subdural space and outward displacement of the cortical veins. So, 
This the cortical vein sign help you to differentiate whether this is a subdural hygroma or just a diffuse brain atrophy. Okay, if the veins are displaced, there is some mass effect, something pushing them inward. This means subdural hygroma. Okay, if the veins are within the same, there is nothing there, or it's displaced laterally towards the skull, the calvarium. It's more in favor of atrophy. Okay. Uh, Okay, subdural fluid can be due to hygromas, hematomas from trauma, surgery, can be empyema due to infection, effusions, intracranial hypertension. Subdural collections can be difficult to distinguish from cerebral atrophy, in which the subarachnoid space is enlarged due to volume loss of the brain. So, identification of the cortical veins along the cerebral convexity can help to differentiate the subdural and subarachnoid uh, uh, spaces. With subdural collection, the cortical veins are displaced inward and away from the dura, as we said. With volume loss, the cortical veins are displaced outward. In infants, the identification of cortical veins is helpful to distinguish external hydrocephalus from subdural collections. What do we mean by that? External hydrocephalus, it's a benign enlargement of the bifrontal subarachnoid spaces. The subarachnoid space at the frontal region, benign enlarged without any pathologic abnormality okay it's self-limiting it resolves by two to three years of age okay if you do brain ultrasound for children this is very common also in ct scan of the infants you always we say by frontal atrophy or frontoparietal atrophy in the child it is not a pathology by per se it's what's called external hydrocephalus okay it's self-limiting. There's nothing to be worried about. It will resolve by itself. However, if you see subdural fluid collections with the veins are away from the uh, skull bone, keep in mind possible child abuse. Okay? You have to be careful from that. Good. So, what do we have here? These are T2 images, flare and axial, uh, so coronal and axial, sorry. What do you think is hyperintense signal? Hyper Seen in both more cerebellar hemispheres. More, more in the left. Okay, and more on the left side and cerebral, 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 cerebral white cerebral. matter. Oh, you, oh, sorry, you are showing but there is abnormal T2 hyperintense signal in both cerebral hemispheres, yeah. more prominent on the left side, and in both cerebellar hemispheres, exactly, subcortical mainly. Exactly, it's also bilateral. So, first of all, what is the diagnosis, let's say, or what's possible differential diagnosis in this case? What's the sign? Okay, the sign can be, they call it either crescent sign, finger-like, granular appearance, scalloped appearance. Okay, okay, finger-like is probably more, looks like that. No, it's multiple, not multiple in function. It is PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy okay uh, you can see as we said multifocal hyperintensities in the left temporal parietal cerebral and cerebellar white matter with the involvement of the subcortical u fibers and uh, bilateral brachial pontus and left corpus medullary cerebelli so it's a diagnostic of pml uh, this is what we call scalloped appearance this appearance is this scalloped pattern okay or finger like or whatever so what's the yeah we are as we said there we are just taking the part that's showing the sign not the whole disease we are not explaining the pml findings however what it's caused by can anybody knows pml what's virus it's reactivation of the JC virus. 
okay, in immunocompromised individuals. There is bilateral asymmetrical involvement of the supratentorial white matter, basal ganglia, thalami, tend to involve the subcortical U fibers with scalloped appearance, sparing the periventricular white matter. Okay, exactly. Uh, unlike MS, there is no significant mass effect. In contrast, HIV encephalopathy cause symmetrical periventricular signal abnormality, sparing the subcortical U fibers. So, if you see the subcortical, yeah, if you see the subcortical U fibers spared, periventricular involved, it is an HIV encephalopathy. If you see the subcortical U fibers involved while periventricular spared, it is PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Okay. Uh, PML can be occasionally affect the cerebellum, brainstem. Atypical imaging manifestations include mildly reduced diffusion, faint peripheral enhancement, hemorrhage, and the gray matter involvement. These are atypical features. If you see hemorrhage, if you see gray matter involvement, some diffusion restriction, some enhancement, it's all yani, un, uh, unfamiliar, unorthodox, okay? Yeah. If there is significant contrast enhancement or mass effect, think of something else. Like infectious encephalitis, lymphoma, acute disseminating encephalomyelitis, you will add them. Think of these pathologies if there is mass effect. Okay? Okay. This is asymmetrical. Yeah, this is asymmetrical, of course. Okay, let's take the last sign. We don't want to be late. That's an easy one. Crescentic appearance of hyperdense. What's the diagnosis, guys? Subdural. Exactly, uh, subdural hematoma. Okay, there is hollow hemispheric subdural hematoma. They are bleeds between the dura and the arachnoid matter. The subdural hematomas are they arterial or venous in origin? Venous, venous. while the epidural are arterial in origin. Okay, uh, usually you see them in the very young, in the elderly, and alcoholic patients. The presence of large subdural spaces predisposed to subdural hematomas with minimal head trauma as an elderly with brain atrophy, okay? The symptoms will, will include a gradual increasing headache, confusion. Uh, at imaging, the subdural hematoma is typically crescentic in appearance, okay? Tracking along the cerebral convexities and the, they can cross beneath the cranial sutures, stopping only at dural reflections, such as the fax cerebri, tentorium cerebelli. The, differenti the differential for hyperdensity in the subdural space include infectious causes like subdural empyema, inflammatory neoplastic etiologies which can readily be distinguished on contrast enhanced imaging. Just give contrast if there is any suspicion or other than subdural hematoma, okay? Like some atypical presentation, atypical age, whatever, okay? We will continue next Sunday, inshallah, with many more signs. Thank you very much.